My name is Ron Samuels. I'm the owner of Marimba One. And right now I'm standing in front of some of our rosewood. This rosewood is rosewood that uh, myself and uh, some of the tuners here at Marimba One individually selected each piece. And all this wood comes from Belize and Guatemala. We'd go down there and order a bunch of wood and then come back six to eight months to a year later when at least a container load was ready. And uh, then we'd go through each piece one by one and making sure that each piece of wood is something we want to make a marimba bar or a xylophone bar out of. Each piece of wood is the ends you can, you can see here are dipped in wax and that's so that the wood won't crack. If you, if you look at boards, oftentimes boards will always be cracked on the end so if you dip the ends in wax they won't crack as easily. And then we ship all the wood back to Arcata, California. We sticker it, which actually all this wood right now is hard packed, but stickering is where you put, you layer it up and you put cross sticks through it so that air can move through it. And then eventually we kiln dry the wood. And after that, after several years, we'll mold the wood into uh, our marimba bar profiles. Here's some molded wood here right now of some of the treble end wood for the marimba. Here's more treble end. This is actually xylophone wood here. And here's more xylophone wood here. This particular xylophone wood is wood that, that I selected out in 2012 when I was in Belize. This wood, it's super, super hard. It's the hardest rosewood I've ever come across. So on our xylophones, when you strike it with a really hard mallet, it will not pit and it will not dent. Here's how a piece of rosewood comes in from Central America. And this is off the bandsaw, and it's hard to see, but it's rough. It's a pretty smooth cut, but it's rough. And the edges have also been ripped here. So this is unmolded, and, and here is after it goes through the molder, um, it's basically smoothed out on the top, the sides, and also has the nice radiuses. And you can still see the wax on the end here. And the next step for this piece of wood here is we're going to cut it to length. And then we'll go ahead and drill it. Uh, we'll chamfer the ends, and then we'll start tuning it. The way we source our wood has is, is evolved over time and, and in terms of also my thinking of how we can make really great musical instruments. What I realized over time is that if I, if I sourced our rosewood from traditional sources, I'd be competing with all the other marimba makers and other people who want Honduran rosewood. So I eventually started traveling to Central America and spending a lot of time down there and develop some of my own sources for rosewood. And the idea is that we would be the only ones who are going for that particular lot of wood and there'd be no one competing for it so we can get really the best wood out of it. The wood I first sourced in Central America came out of uh, Belize and Honduran rosewood grows in both Belize and Guatemala and a little bit in southern Mexico but it's been banned from cutting and export in Mexico for many many years. And in Belize, it used to be called British Honduras, and that's why the wood is called Honduran Rosewood, even though it does not grow in Honduras. I connected up with a little village in Belize. Uh, it was a Mayan Indian community, and the way they were originally cutting their wood was they would take a table saw, and they would first take literally a, you know, a, chunk, of, a chunk of a tree, and they'd they, they call it breaking it. They'd cut it in half with a chainsaw and then they'd run it through a table saw one way and then flip it upside down and do it the other way. And they're burning up motors every couple days. And in that area of Belize, to get a motor fixed or rewound, it was a whole day trip to another town. You have to wait overnight while it's being fixed or two days and then another day trip back. So when I realized that, uh, I sent down uh, what's called a mobile dimension mill. and. We paid for everything and we sent it down to Southern Belize. I traded with this family in this village for rosewood. And actually the wood here behind me, this actual wood here is some of that wood that we bartered for. And eventually they paid off the mill and started buying a lot of wood from them. Over time, I developed another source of rosewood in Guatemala. And to get to where I was going in Guatemala, it would take over a day, like 24 to 30 hours. But as the crow flew, you know, as a bird would fly, it would take, it was like maybe 60 miles. But there was, at the time, there was no roads through there. And it was, uh, it was, it was a pretty intense journey to get to that place where I'd source the wood. So I'd go to visit these people frequently and I'd let them know just what we wanted in terms of the cut of the wood and where in the log I wanted to cut, to be cut from the wood and how, 
we could accept certain pieces and why we couldn't accept other pieces and just develop these relationships with these people to cut our, uh, all our roses for us. Buying rosewood in Central America is highly unpredictable. You can't just order wood and have it occur in any particular time frame. So sometimes the wood would be held up because of customs or whatever reason and you just really never knew what was going to happen. And while this is all going on, rosewood was becoming more and more scarce. And and first, when I first started buying rosewood, it was on CITES 3. And so CITES 3 is a watch list. Hey, we think we have some potential problems with this particular tree being overcut. And then in uh, 2017, I think on January 2nd, it was, list it was moved to CITES 2. And CITES 2 is super highly regulated. Essentially, it means that from forest to factory here, transit routes, everything has to be documented and substantiated that it's all legal. And in the meantime, when the trees are cut, for example, in Belize, at that time, what, what the Belizean uh, forestry was doing was they, would, they took this big track of land, a really large area of land that hadn't been cut for a very, very, very long time. And there's a lot of rosewood on that land. And they broke it up into 30 different sections. And, and so they allowed people to come in and cut only the rosewood uh, that was 14 inches and in longer at chest height. That's how they'd measure it. And so we bought the rosewood off that first, uh, when they f off that first little section that they let out. Year two, they went to section two, and after 30 years, they'll go around to the first one that, that we bought the wood from, and the, and the baby rosewood trees would have grown up, and, uh, and then continue the cycle. And also rosewood, the way it grows, it, it has seeds, it's in the legume family, it has little seeds and it's like little leathery seed pods, and the tree will drop seeds, the seeds will sprout. Also, it'll, uh, it'll stump sprout, which means that when you cut a tree, it'll send out new trees. And also, while the tree is growing, it'll send out leaders, like little, like little baby trees that just on their own will start growing up. In Guatemala, the, the forestry's regeneration process there, after it went to CITES II in 2017, is that for every rosewood tree that's cut, they're required to plant uh, 14 rosewood trees. And so on our website, you can see pictures of the nursery in Guatemala where there's like literally thousands of rosewood trees there. And what, uh, what they'll do is they'll send people out in the forest at certain times of year to collect all the seed pods. They'll germinate those in little greenhouses and, you know, get them to decent sized trees and then they'll go and replant those in the forest. At that time also to export a marimba out of the U.S. we needed essentially a marimba, uh, passport. They didn't call it that but it was CITES documentation to prove that the wood was legally cut and uh, since then they've relaxed that particular requirement and through this whole process I appreciated the tightening up of all the rules around around Rosewood and it was it was definitely necessary to do because when I would be down there I would see so much Rosewood being cut clearly illegally one night I was coming out of I would stay at a jungle lodge in southern Belize and I was coming I was coming in at night and uh, I saw cars with rosewood in their, in their trunks, tractors pulling, trailers with rosewood, trucks all coming out of the hills and uh, actually all that rosewood was destined for China because at that time uh, it was a super hot, mar super hot market in China for rosewood for furniture. And so I think CITES has done a really great thing for rosewood and uh, it's going to keep it around for us instrument makers.